Okay. Well, we are officially at time, so I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, calendars. It's 12 o'clock, and this is uh, definitely an opportunity for us um, to share with each other, uh, all the women leaders, uh, future, current, up-and-comers. Um, and also, we always try to invite every month um, our athletics directors and our conference commissioners so they can uh, listen and hear um, and learn other things that hopefully um, individuals can share as well on their campuses or within their conference. Um, just so you all know how we, we get the, the, the different topics that we're doing is we did a survey early on to our current list of senior women leaders. And we just kind of asked, you know, what, what's important to you? So just know if you liked what you see today, uh, you've got another topic that you'd love for us to find a subject matter expert, which could be you. Um, you could be the next person to actually um, be a part of this presentation process. Um, as always, we are recording this session. Uh, we will post this onto our Facebook page. We'll post it onto our landing page. And then uh, we will also send it out in social media and then also an email to make sure that you all have the recording. Um, if you wanna share it to, to anybody else. So I would like to start by um, introducing uh, Betsy Cutler, who is one of our national partners. Um, she is our uh, mental health online uh, provider for the NAIA. And she's been an amazing resource, not only to the national office, but also to many of our institutions. Um, this is also a great way for her to get to know you, uh, we'd like to definitely uh, keep a, an eye on the chat box to see if there's any questions that uh, do arise. Um, we did ask you all to submit some of your thoughts of what you would like to see in this presentation from Betsy. And she's taken that and she's incorporated that into um, our presentation for today. And Iris, I love your little, your little hat there. That's so cute, a little festive. <laughs> Um, so Betsy, if it's all right, I would love to turn it over to you. Okie dokie. Let's make sure that I can uh, share screen. Okay. And I did put multiple people can share, so you should be good to roll. I think we got it. Okay. Everybody good? Everybody sees it? Yes. Awesome. Here we go. Well, um, thank you. Paige uh, for handing this over to me and giving me the opportunity yet again to come and talk with our NA, uh, NAIA institutions. Um, as she alluded to earlier, I built this seminar based on survey results that you've taken race recently. Um, I, my hope is that this is going to be a collaborative presentation. Uh, I'd like to hopefully have some authentic discussion and exchanging of ideas. Um, you all may have a great program that you've instituted into your institution that can maybe be adapted and then taken to another uh, department that they can then utilize uh, within their ecosystem to either support their coaches <clears throat> or support their athletes. So that's what our goal is. Um, although I will not be able to go into depth into all of the topics that you all have requested, um, I have done my best to try to hit on a couple different things that hopefully will bring it all together uh, for you. One, um, we hope that you walk away knowing what your athletes' perceptions are on mental health supports within their um, systems, which would of course be your systems. Um, we hope that, too, that we can define what are your needs specifically in supporting your own mental health and your other coaches' mental health. And then three, we hope to continue building the community of... Um, Building a community of ideas to support one another. I think somebody needs to cut off their mute. I think there's a couple of you guys. There we go. I think that's better. Okay. So let us move forward. Um, so we're going to kind of begin with what are mental health perceptions with our athletes, 
Um, so last April uh, at the National Convention in Kansas City, uh, there were uh, representatives of the ASA community across the nation that were invited to come and participate in the National Convention. On Friday, they held a day-long learning and seminars that were built specifically for the ASA um, student-athletes. I was lucky and fortunate to be able to lead them for two hours on mental health on that Friday afternoon. We began with the conversation of where were they, how were they feeling in their own overall health and well-being. And then we knew we wanted to break them up into groups. And so we broke them up into four groups and we asked them three prompt questions. Uh, those for the first question was, what's going well on your campus uh, in regards to mental health, either your campus, through your athletic department, or on your team specifically? And then the second question is, what, were, what are some of the barriers that prevent you from seeking the help that you need in regards to mental health supports? And then the third one was, what's their wish list? And we felt like it is important um, for you all as administrators, and most of you are probably also coaches, to understand what you need to offer your athletes is to actually hear where they are and what is preventing them from doing seeking what they want and what is their wish list so we're going to kind of go through those right now just so that you guys have a really good basis on what your athletes are looking for and why they're looking for it so as we went into and we talked about celebrating their successes, I want to tell you that they're at the end of some of these, it'll be times two or times three or times four. What that means is that that theme was found across that many number of groups, knowing that there were four complete groups that we uh, broke them down into. So one athlete said that we have we hold a mental health week. On our campus, it's a campus-wide, week-long mental health awareness program. Uh, all four of the groups found that the faculty was supportive and understanding of their absences and willing to work with student-athletes to meet the needs of both academic and athletic stressors, which I thought was great. One athlete reported that on their campus, uh, it's campus wide, they do a taboo topic of the month email. We can make sure that everybody's muted. That'd be great. Um, then that what they do is they meet two weeks later um, and have that discussion on that mental health concept. One athlete said that they actually specifically do the program <laughs> mental health sit down program for their athletes. I thought that was amazing um, that it's actually integrated into their athletic department. Other athletes, and that there's two different groups, so athletes within this group said that their actual coaches and their teams actually share. Uh, their own mental health well-being. Uh, they didn't talk about how often they do it. Um, perhaps every few weeks they go in and they just do like a check-in with one another within the team setting. Um, so I thought that was fantastic as well. So the last one is that they felt like their athletic trainers um, are always willing to have the mental health conversations. They look at them as their advocates and that's amazing. So let's talk about the campus barriers that they found. So my company, we go in and we go into clients and we actually do something very similar to this. And we do what we call student athlete needs analysis and we ask similar questions and then we have dialogue with our athletes. And so I will tell you in recent clients that this first one was also found in other clients as well. And that is this feeling that the department is silent on mental health concerns. Basically no corporate wide or department wide messaging for their athletes on mental health. 
Also, four, all four of the groups found that there was no mental health support program on campus. They felt that um, the male sports were discouraged from discussing mental health. Student athletes felt like um, they were holding on to problems until it becomes a huge problem. And what this plays into is the dynamic of being proactive versus reactive. Uh, coaches are not aware of or educated about mental health issues. Two groups talked about that. Um, they all discussed that it would mean a lot to them if the coaches actually brought up and discussed mental health within the team dynamic. Expectations and pressures from coaches. Issues aren't discussed until something bad happens. Once again, that's back on the same topic of are we reactive or are we proactive? And one of the last things that they, all four groups reported was the sense of the stigma that still exists in regards to them in their roles and what team captains are feeling. So both the ASA leadership as well as the team captains are feeling like they are not able to present as having mental health struggles because they feel like there's stigma involved with that in that leadership role and that it may be viewed as a sign of weakness. So I'm curious, and this is not rhetorical, I would really love to hear some um, feedback from you all, is were you all surprised with the athletes' results? I'd love to hear what you guys' uh, feelings and thoughts are on that. Is there anybody that is not surprised? And if you're not surprised, why? Okay. So nobody. So it's interesting that, um, that we have, uh, these kinds of statements by our athletes. Maybe this is the first time that you guys have seen them. Um, in regards to that, I'd like to know how many of you all, maybe by show of hands, um, have an active ASA group in your department. And this could also be your SAC. So just if you all have SACs, correct. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Great, great, great. Good, good. Um, I asked that question because one of the ways for you all to meet your athletes' needs is to lean on those group, uh, that group of leadership within your athletic department. Um, if you guys ask them, you know, in a safe, confident, um, confidential meeting and what are their needs and what would they like to have in order to go forward, I think that you all would find that they would be very engaged and very willing to maybe answer some of your questions and to help you guide on your own campus. What are some things that they can um, ask for you and that maybe you can um, integrate into your programming when it comes to um, athlete mental health. So can you all provide any specifics in regards to what's going well? Um, same kind of question that we asked our athletes. What things are your institution or your department Department or your teams are doing to support your athlete mental health? Are there any creative things that you guys are instituting or have implemented? Um, now's the time to maybe have that conversation and bring it forth so that all of us on this uh, presentation can take some ideas back and forth. So if there's anything from there, I would love to hear it. Yeah, so I don't see my boss on here. Are you on here, Danita? I am. She's oh, okay. Do you want to talk about our mental health um, that we did with our student athletes? 
Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Prisce. Oh, I thought you were going to do it. Sorry. <laughs> so um, RCSA, um, they did kind of a, a mental health. Um, um, it was a Zoom meeting, wasn't it? And they had kids um, to gave them the link and kind of chimed in and just really talked about some of the different things that they were going on. Um, and it went really well. And we also had um, um, a mental health. Um, it was during finals finals um with the coffee tea chocolate and we provide mental health um resources um on a sheet or even a qr code and a couple of our sports actually has um a mental health counselor that comes and meets with the team and does uh, a lot of the groups so those are the three things that we're doing at langston awesome so was that something that you like you did recently like within the last week because finals are upon us our finals were actually three weeks ago, right before oh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay. But you did it in a time, in time, you know, with that, right? Yes, ma'am. And so you said that it was, um, did you, was it also in person? Was it hybrid or was it all via Zoom? We've had two. So one was by Zoom and one was in person. So the, the week of finals uh, within person. And then right when we returned to school, I think like in August, September, they did um, a Zoom like group session. And who led the discussion? Was it a clinical, was it clinical personnel from your institution? Um, it was Arby, wasn't it, AD? Yeah, yeah. so um, the, the student athletes wanted an opportunity just to talk things out. And so that you know that um, the particular things that I'm going through aren't necessarily um, uh, just something that's uh, just with track and field or just with softball. They just want to talk about some things and just uh, help each other out. We, I don't know if Ms. Kinzel, if you were on that, I was not on that meeting. We gave them the opportunity to talk about some things. And then our officers will usually come back and like, these are the three things that we feel like we need to address as a whole or we need some help with. But um, we did not have a clinical psychologist or anything on that meeting. We just wanted them to uh, to talk things out with each other. And then they know that after that, they can come to us like this was a, a, a very pervasive issue and we may need some additional training to help us through this. So they seem to really love it. I'm not surprised by that. Basically what you were doing and the reality is that of all of the athletes on our institutions, very few need clinical intervention and even less than those need crisis intervention. But what they all do need is support for anxiety and stress, coping mechanisms and resiliency stuff. And that's what your opportunity provided for them. Um, even just having that connectability with somebody else that is in the same shoes of them and hearing that they are not in it by themselves is so affirming and so supportive. I love that you guys did that. Is there any other else, anybody, any other institutions that have done anything else creative or something else like that? Now's the time to share so that we can maybe take them to different uh, institutions. Anybody else out there with anything else to share? Hi, my name is Katie Rouse. I'm at Westcliff University. Um, we just held a, our first um, student athlete mental health and wellness day, and we did it specifically for fall sport athletes once their season was done, because that's sort of a routine is changed. Things are very stressful now. I don't know what to do time frame for them. Um, and so we had just a day where, of relaxation for them. We provided lunch. We had um, some journaling stations. We had yoga. We had a sound bath and meditation section. Um, there was just, it was just, you know, I think we did three hours, but just a, a morning of relaxation and celebration for their season. Um, we had really positive feedback from it and um, we'll be doing it for the, the, um, winter and spring sports as well, but also looking now to expand it department wide all at one time if we can, because it did receive such positive um, feedback. 
Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have no doubt that that was um, highly productive and really helped support uh, your athletes. I absolutely love that idea. Uh, okay, any other ideas from any other campuses? I have a question. Uh, I just wanted to know the last person that was talking, could you say those ideas again? <laughs> Hi, yes, no problem. So we did, we provided um, free lunch, just like a, a buffet style lunch where they could come in and just hang out. Um, we had a journaling station. I don't think I said massage therapist, but we also had a massage therapist come where they could sign up for a 10 minute chair massage. Um, and then we had yoga and um, sound bath or sound meditation towards the end. Thank you so much for that. And then someone also put in the chat um, at Bushnell University, this is from Sarah, that they have a team counselor assigned to every team and that there are three group meetings with the team and their counselor throughout the season. And that counselor comes to one practice a week and as many games as possible and does one-to-one -one sessions with their teams and athletes as prompted by the students. That's amazing. Thank you, Sarah. That's amazing. Thank you so much for adding that. That's um, hugely supportive uh, and love that idea. Anything else before we move on? Wow, you guys are doing some fantastic things out there. I'm really excited to hear that. And I hope that that was the hope of this uh, session is that you all can walk away with some really creative, unique things that you can adapt to your institution. So now let's talk about um, what you all feel may be some of the barriers for you all as administrators and potentially also as coaches to meet or support your athlete's mental health. So what are some of the things that you all find are your biggest struggles in either implementing programs or um, offering resources for them? One came in the chat was uh, coaches support and buy-in is a barrier from Claire. Um, yeah, not the first time. Anybody else? Keep going. Okay, I'll go. Um, Brittany Stewart from Harrisville State University. Um, one of the biggest barriers we have is we use the same counselor uh, that the university uses. So um, most of the time, she's either busy with uh, servicing other student athletes. And so uh, that leads me to, you know, try to step in and handle those mental health issues, which I'm not equipped as much as our counselor. And so um, that's been the biggest barrier for us. So that's not the first time I've heard that. As a matter of fact, that's very predominant. And honestly, that's predominant, not just in your level, but in, across all levels of athletics. And two more comments came in. Um, not enough uh, counselors uh, in the university on campus to serve the student needs. So just inventory, I guess that's from Tracy. And then uh, Corey from one of our uh, conference commissioners said not, not to overstep um, boundaries, doesn't want to overstep the boundaries and get into something that they don't want to be involved in, maybe a fine line. And then another is a budgetary issue and using a lot of creativity for events and ideas. All of those are very true barriers. Um, very interesting. Um, uh, I would, I would love to, you know, maybe uh, delve in a little further um, to not wanting to overstep the boundaries um, and get into something that you um, don't want to be involved in. Do you think that that's is that from a coaching perspective, um, where it's that you don't, you don't want to come off as being a mental health clinician because 
let's be honest. And I do this with our athlete seminars. And that is that I tell the athletes that your coaches and your admin do not have those initials behind the name that qualify them as mental health professionals and clinicians. Um, So is that kind of what you were talking about, Corey, kind of that line between how do I support your athlete, but how do I also establish clear boundaries from what is appropriate for us to do? Curious if that's what you were meaning by that. Yeah, I think so, Betsy. I I think what I sense is out there sometimes is maybe a coach identifies something that might potentially be going on, but they're very fearful um, to step into that space because then maybe parents get involved or maybe um, roommates get involved or dynamics of the team get involved. And all of a sudden, a, a small thing has become a big thing and maybe more than they ever wanted to handle at the same time. So just outside looking in, I think at athletics, sometimes when you look at team dynamics and somebody may have a mental health potential issue, um, coaches and assistant coaches and support staff maybe are a little fearful to overexert themselves into it for the fear that it might lead to something bigger than they're ready to handle. I think that is a fabulous point. And I actually think That is where maybe we can come in and do some training for our coaches so that they can help understand creating their own appropriate boundary within the team dynamic and with their athletes. That's also the benefit to doing one with our athletes is that we express to them what I have just previously said, and that is that they need to understand the expectations, uh, what their expectations should be from their coach and what they should not be. Um, but I think that is an absolutely valid point. And until we get everybody in our company, what we say is that our our athletes' expectations of their coaches seem to be up here, and our coaches may be a little lower than we need, but we like to modulate the groups so that they both are on the same mental health page of the playbook, um, but they also know what are appropriate expectations, and it is okay to set appropriate boundaries. So I totally get what you're saying, Corey. Um, one other Betsy, oh, yeah, that maybe something that comes into play there is the gender part of it, too. Um, I think a female coach with female athletes has a lot bigger, uh, longer rope to work with than a, a male coach with female athletes. And that probably is kind of an obvious statement, but I, I think that that dynamic plays out as well, because I just think that there becomes a little bit of a, a line crossed at times or a fear of a line crossed at times. So I could see that in play. And I think that's why having strong assistant coaches to offset maybe a male coach, if that's the scenario you're in, I think is really critically important. I think that's a fabulous point. Um, I will tell you, I did an NAIA um, presentation in June for the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And one of the topics that they wanted me to discuss was the thought of male coaches to female teams. Because the reality is that most of our teams, like 70% of our teams across all conferences and all levels, um, are coached by men. And so I actually dug into some research and there are some definitely some interesting concepts out there that could be helpful in helping our male coaches in dealing with their female athletes. So once again, Corey, a really great point. And I absolutely think that there is some value in having that discussion in regards to that. Um, I am curious, um, how many of you all actually in considering of the last one of the last ones was the budgetary constraint? How many of you all actually have a mental health programming line item built into your budget that can either cover programming and or clinical interventions? Maybe by a show of hands. I'm just scrolling through so that I can see. Okay. I'm seeing no hands, so it sounds like we need some money. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Partly what that is, is that we need to, um, which is, I will tell you, I have, this has kind of been my feedback over the last six to nine months, is that our athletic programs desperately want to um, implement programming um, or and or try to find a creative way to support clinical care for their athletes. 
The problem is that um, we have not created that line item um, for potential projections and those needs of mental health um, interventions and programs. So that would be one of the, probably the biggest areas for you all as administrators to go back and maybe have that discussion, knowing that your upcoming budgets are, I'm sure, being talked about starting in January and probably finalized through April and May. That's part of the conversation that we need to have. Um, there was one other chat. Paige, what, what else was in the chat? Yeah, one more from another conference commissioner from Michael. Um, he's always hearing that directors is an acknowledgement of mental health issues on their campus, uh, but they don't necessarily have the experience or credentials to address any issues. Campus resources don't exist and are stretched too thin and no resources are available for the third party uh, partnership. This leads them to be very reactionary to things that happen instead of being proactive. Um, true. That's all very true. Uh, but there are ways that we can kind of maybe wrap around that and maybe kind of divert some of that stuff and maybe to address those. And hopefully by the end um, that we can get there and I can um, give you some of what some of those ideas that we have uh, brewing. Um, let's move on. Um, so I want to talk about what the athletes were asking for specifically. Um, honestly, the three top barriers uh, that athletes face in um, finding mental health supports is um, their mental health literacy, um, accessibility to clinical care, which we just had a conference, another conference commissioner talk about, and then stigma. So everything that my company does and that we advocate for you all to do is one of those three things you all we all together need to be working to increase our athlete and our coach mental health literacy we need to do what we can to try to uh offer additional clinical supports creatively and then we need to keep talking about mental health and introducing awareness and concepts within a team and an athletic department dynamic so that we can de decrease stigma. The more we decrease stigma, the more we have athletes seeking mental health supports and therefore they may be being proactive versus reactive, which is all what our athletic departments want. So here are the things that they have asked for. Um, the ability to make a, to take a mental health day. And that was across three. I will tell you from our personal individual client athlete assessments, it was one of the most number one talked about requests from our athletes. And there are certain programs, honestly, and even some teams that are introducing this concept. Um, you can look at it as... Um, a PTO day, a day off. Um, all of them, though, there are criteria built around it. So it's not just a freebie. And there are certain um, expectations from the coach um, when that happens. And that's something that um, we can talk about, that we talk about a little bit later. Resources that support diversity. Now, so this is interesting. This is actually how the intersection of DEI supports mental health. So that's an important concept that they want integrated. Um, they want someone available to listen 24 seven. Um, I get that their responses, there may be some sort of financial um, aspect of it that you may or may not be able to provide for them. But there may be some creative ways that we can actually give this to them. And so hopefully at the end, I will give you at least one or two resources for that. Workshop on it's okay to not be okay. They want to know that you guys are looking at them and understand that they may be struggling with stress or anxiety. And once again, it may not be need a clinical intervention and it's absolutely not a crisis intervention, but it's they're acknowledging that they are struggling in all the things that they have to deal with. Make access to mental health resources easier. Once again, that's kind of um, listen to someone, you know, have somebody listen to you 24 seven. 
a mental health discussion sponsored by ASA at least once a month. This is something that you all can implement in its immediacy right now, um, either in your SAC or in your ASA. Sports psychologists on staff. I love that we have one organization that already does this, um, has clinical. They said sports psychologists, but we're talking clinical care, somebody that can go in and have conversations conversations with them. Um, the reality is that a lot of institutions don't have the financial um, ability to do that. So what are some creative ways that we can maybe introduce that? Um, so we can talk a little bit about that at the end as, as well. Workshop for coaches. This has been, once again, anecdotally, what we have found in this as well as in our other clients' needs assessments is that they want their coaches more prepared or more educated on what to do if an athlete is struggling. Regular mental health counseling for maintenance. I interpret this as meaning more the fact that they would love um, integration of resiliency techniques and coping mechanisms. Um, something that can be done maybe from a team-wide or a team ecosystem perspective. So at the conclusion, after we reviewed all of these with from the National Convention, we had some more general dialogue about what those responses were. And we had discussion and we actually talked to them about the fact that they um, need to develop other aspects of what, what overall health and well-being means to them. Um, that there are, they need to take care of physical, emotional, psychological, as well as a few more that we actually review in the next slide. Um, but as a byproduct of taking care of themselves and trying to integrate and take time to develop all of these other components of overall health and well-being, that that byproduct is that they feel healthier and that if they feel healthier, they perform better. And there's a number of, there's a lot of data and research that supports that. So along those lines, we want to make sure that you all understand these are the five components that we discussed with them. And that it's physically, intellectually, emotionally, socially, and spiritually, that these five components um, all work together to build their overall health and well-being. Um, one thing that a coach can maybe do is think about integrating ways that you can do some one of these other components into your ecosystem. Um, the athletes really came to a point where they said, the way that they articulated it, I will clarify for you guys. Basically, what they were asking for is a paradigm shift in how their coaches interact with them. That they feel like, based on this information, if a coach interacts with their athletes in a holistic way and really feel like they value their player bigger than just their um, what they can offer on the field of play, that what will happen is that athlete internalizes that that coach is there for their overall health and well-being, and therefore they positively respond, therefore having better sport performance on the field of play. So that's kind of a paradigm shift that they are kind of looking for in their coaching ecosystems. Now, let's kind of shift into coaches' perceptions on mental health in general. Rhetorical question you don't need to answer, but I want you to think about it, is what is your attitude or what is your coach's attitude on mental health and well-being and this was actually brought up as a barrier in the chat and that is what is the buy-in of your coaches to understand the need to have conversations and integrate mental health into the team dynamic honestly the last slide hopefully will be one of those um points that you all can articulate with your coaching staff is that if they make that paradigm shift is that they will actually get more from their athletes than if they only focus on them in their sport of play. I think another question would be, and I, I, if you all feel 
open to respond. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on how you think the players, either in your team, if you're a coach, or if you're an admin, your athletes within the department, how they would answer the same question. Do you, what do you think your athletes feel is the attitude of their coaches? Is there anybody that would be willing to answer that? Okay. I get that that's a pointed question. Um, but I, I'd like for you guys to think about that because that, that kind of ties in to where your athletes are and that if they, um, if they are not maybe feeling like the coaches are invested or interested in having at least mental health conversations within the team, then there may be some more coaching that needs to be done within your coaching staff. And that's the purpose of these two questions. Betsy, uh, can I ask you a question? Sure. All right. I've had multiple conversations with particularly female athletes in regards to, again, a male coach that the coach says, yes, I love you. I care for you. I want to take care of you, so forth. And yet when they approach this individual, they feel like the coach is gaslighting them of you're too young to have these issues. You're fine. Your grades are wonderful. You're doing well on the court. Like you shouldn't have any of these issues. And it's one of those moments where thankfully they feel that they can come to me and have those conversations. But how do we address that? Because it goes back to the coach's perception. It's not necessarily that they're saying mental health doesn't matter, but are you understanding that when these people approach you with their concerns and it's not even sport related, that how you address them is indicating how you truly feel about mental health? Great question. One of those things is, that we do when we give to the coaches seminar, and that is techniques like reflective listening, and reflective responsing. So in that, in that instance, instead of the coach using terminology that says, well, I don't, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be feeling this, or you're too young to feel that. Instead, we need to educate our coaches to say, what I hear is that you're struggling right now with some things that are, you know, going on at home. And even if I may not understand them, I'm here for you to have a conversation um, and we can try to help figure those out together. And if not, there is a process that I can get you to somebody that can help you have that conversation. That's what your athletes are wanting. I, I think part of the concern for the coaches is that they feel like they're going to have to jump in and maybe interact with a, an athlete that they are not comfortable on. And I totally understand that. But in this instance, like you said, there is a sense of gaslighting in the sense that our coaches are saying one thing, but their actions are not doing the same. The important how we how we address that is educating our coaches with specific phrases and terminology that they can integrate into their own team concept and into their own interpersonal style when they talk with the athletes. And it's having those key Rolodex comments and responses when they feel confident that they can respond to that athlete. And once again, that also goes back to them having really good boundaries. Um, you know, Betsy, I understand that, you know, you're struggling with, um, uh, you know, what happened, that's something that your mom said when you were at home. And I understand that that is affecting a lot of pieces of your life. And I don't know how I can help support you specifically on that. But what I can do is I'm here to listen. And if I can help you um, provide a plan to deal with that, I will. If not, I'm invested to getting you in conversation with somebody who can. That's the kinds of terminology that if we can embed and actually give 
our coaches that then they have it. And like we like to say, a Rolodex of phrases and terminology that they can utilize, as well as integrating what are really good boundaries for themselves in those situations. Did that answer your question? Yes. And it's interesting to, to also like enter into those conversations with the coaches then too, because we want to talk about trust and boundaries and everything, but in for like a senior woman leader to be saying, Hey, I've had a conversation with one or two of your athletes. Can we handle this? Or do we want to step into it almost like universally and just make it very generic to teach all of the coaches and like that's where I personally have issues with filtering and implementing these concepts and ideas is do I go at the coach because I don't want to feel like I'm attacking them or do I teach it holistically and train it so that they all are understanding it and learning it we're always going to advocate Kate, for you to teach it holistically and to the entire department. Um, one value in doing that, um, so like when we come in and we do a coaches, we do lots of these different things, but we also break them up into groups and do something very similar to what we're doing today and what we actually have as recommendations at the end of the seminar um, is that they get to have conversations with one another and they get to talk about anecdotally things that they've already uh, dealt with and the reality is that every coach has dealt with some sort of mental health or emotional issue with their athletes and instead of sucking it in and not um learning from it it's more it's way more helpful for them to anecdotally share as a in a small group setting and learn from one another in ways that they can intervene interact and also help their athletes so we are going to always advocate to do it from an entire group session because then they can learn from one another and it doesn't feel like they're being shamed or called out so that would be what my recommendation is Hey, um, Betsy, um, yes. I've got a quick question for you. Um, the thing that hits me hard here is that I think a lot of this is based on fear. You know, we're afraid. We're, we're afraid that we're going to say something that we shouldn't. We're afraid because we, we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. Um, we're afraid to open Pandora's box. I think those fears um, really override us. And that gets back to kind of what Corey was saying. And what Fache were saying is, you know, how can we best deal with our fears when it comes to mental health and our student athletes? Because I think that's a big part of it. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, as you were talking, I was going to say, yeah, that reflects back to what Corey had to say. Um, that's the value of doing coaching in services mm -hmm. on mental health. And that um, I will be honest. I'm very transparent. Um, I do not advocate and our company doesn't advocate sitting down and doing seminars on signs and symptoms. Um, we have an avenue where we can give that to you and you guys can have it in the palm of your hand with our app, which is at the end of this. And you all will download it. And guess what? There's 17 lists of signs and symptoms in there and it's at your fingertips anytime you want it. So I don't feel like it's value is to do a seminar or a session with our coaches on signs and symptoms of various issues because the reality is that you're not going to remember them. You need to have access to them. What you need to train your coaches on is how to interact with their athlete. Um, what are phrases? What are their boundaries? What are expectations? Um, talking to one another, setting up this um, dynamic where they are using one another in the coaching system mm -hmm. as helpful, supportive, and how to utilize what somebody else has experienced and be able to introduce it into your own Rolodex and being able to use it going forward with your athletes. That's really what you all need to do. You need to have these conversations from a coach-wide level where you're integrating comments, conversations, because I will tell you, knowledge and education for our coaches equals confidence. And that's what we're looking for.
is that our coaches feel confident in being able to have a con- conversation with their athlete. Now, and we'll be clear, they're not going to be perfect at it. And that's okay. Because if you have that relationship with your team that you've opened up having that mental health conversation, they're going to know that you are coming from a place of authenticity and really caring about who they are. Then those conversations, whether they become natural or not natural for the coach, doesn't really matter. What matters is that the athlete feels that they are heard and they are responded to and that coach is engaged in helping them get what they need, even if the coach cannot offer it. Does that kind of help with what you were saying? And Betsy, I'm going to give a two minute countdown to we'll turn it over to our national office staff. I know this is a great dialogue, but also want to be respectful of everybody's time. So let's see if we can, we'll try to walk through and see if we can get to some. So this is my comment quickly on the five components of physical, intellectual, um, emotional, social, and spiritual. Hey, guess what? Coaches, you need to do this too. And that you all need to be aware of your own mental health and that this is probably one of the most stressful coaching positions in the world is a collegiate coach. Somebody asked specifically um, about tapping. It is based on acupuncture and it is basically where you do a tapping exercise on your meridian points. Different Different places have say there's nine or there's 12. The value of the tapping is doing it when you are feeling um, like a negative feeling, emotion, or event, and it helps you to work through that, but it doesn't take the issue away. What it does is it takes away that emotional response to the negative input and then puts you in a place where you can respond to it constructively. Ultimately, coaching. Modeling good behavior, mental health behavior, is the best way to show your athletes that mental health is important. Um, And that means you need to take care of your own mental health. So let's see, nuggets of advice. Let's see if we can get through it. Um, Know your department's institution or institution's mental health policies. Do you all have a mental health emergency plan? Um, Make sure your coaches know it. Make them have it. Make them know it. Because once again, knowledge equals confidence. If they know that something's going to happen and how to respond to it, they will confidently feel better in addressing their athletes. Educate your athletes to all of the mental health resources on the campus. Specifically, we say in our coaches seminar, the very first meeting you have with your team, you need to introduce mental health. And part of that is where's the campus counseling center? What's the address? What's the phone number? I mean, take them on a field trip, lock them there. What we have found in these results, as well as our other client results, is that your athletes have no idea. What are your campus mental health resource, um, um, resources and where to go for them? Integrate mental health topical discussions into your team ecosystem. Somebody asked, how do you integrate tidbit information um, for the team? I put stars on here because I think that's fabulous and that's a great way to do it. Our company is busy building video seminars that are meant to be viewed and seen in the athlete ecosystem. That's athletes, coaches, and trainers, and any admin. As everybody hears all the same information, you are decreasing stigma, increasing knowledge, and opening up the door for them to seek mental health help. Integrate resiliency and anxiety um, reduction techniques into your team, into the actual team format. Bring in somebody. You may not be able to afford a sports psychologist on your campus, but you can pay a clinical psychologist or a sport performance consultant, you know, $150 or $200 for one hour to give your team those resiliency techniques or anxiety reduction techniques. Schedule periodic team mental health check-ins. This was a big one. It was on the conference. I, I hope you guys saw that as well as it came up into our um, into our conversations with our recent um, clients. And this costs nothing. You can integrate this tomorrow. They want to have a team text where you guys are just doing a mental health check-in. How are you? Everybody good? I know you guys are probably feeling stressed about finals. Remember, 
take your breath, do this, do here's that's what you all need to do. Your athletes are going to respond to that. You are looking at them holistically and not just for what their performance on the field of play. Once again, meet as coaches, discuss with one another what they're doing and what they're integrating to support their athletes' mental health. Um, collaborate with one another on ways to support one another's mental health. Um, you all need to take care of your mental health. If you're a single coach of a team, Maybe partner with another coach so that way you guys can maybe take three hours off where you are decompressing and you guys are sharing one another's resources because you all have to take care of your own mental health as well. And Betsy, Other is there any, yeah, is there, to sorry, I hate to cut you off, but is there any way to kind of wrap this up? We have, we've got to get the staff uh, in to give a quick little tidbit. So I just want to make sure because all this is going to be online. So this is the last page for this. It's um, I will leave it up there so that it'll be part of uh, the um, video. Uh, but we could not discuss this anyways. Uh, I knew we weren't going to have time for that. Um, in regards to the mental health, I, I told you guys a little bit about that. What we do is education, consulting, provide access to clinical supports, and we have technology. In regards to technology, this is a free app. Download it. It has four or five of these are free. Not all of them are free. Um, a lot of the buttons, several of the buttons are only for our branded client, branded clients that have branded versions. But the common signs and symptoms are in there. There's 17 different common signs and symptoms that coaches can have. Give it to your athletes. There's also mental health resources in there. And that's a one-click button for your athletes. The very first one in there, there's more than 20 hotlines. The very first one is the National Suicide Hotline. And that addresses your athletes wanting to have somebody to talk to 24-7. So that's where we are. I know I've rushed the last few parts. Hopefully this will be available when you guys get to the video. Um, I am so glad that you guys invited me to be a part today. If there's anything that my company or myself can do to help clarify, please reach out. Um, and I want to thank you again, Paige, for giving me the opportunity to do this. I hope that you guys at least walk away with some good nuggets and some things that you could potentially integrate into your own program. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to get to what we needed to for the staff. So I'm going to leave that up to Ty, um, who's on here right now. We really needed to share with you guys the um, the scorecard. And it looks like, can you, it, it, it looks like I'm sharing my screen, but I don't see it being shared. Do you guys see Hi. understanding the scorecard? We see it. Okay. You see it. Okay. Super. Ty, maybe we can just do an introduction and then we can uh, get you on for the next because this is really important. We were hoping to have 10 minutes for this. And we have three. So let me know what you'd like to do. Um, I can just give a little quick overview. I won't be able to go into uh, like to show the scorecard and everything like that, but just to give a quick overview of the, what the champions of character is. So hello, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day. My name is Ty Dean. I'm the Student Athlete Experience and Development Coordinator here at the NAIA. And I oversee Champions of Character and the Champions of Character Scorecard. So the, all this stuff is very personal to me, and I, I enjoy this stuff very much. So just an overview of Champions of Character. It's a program that was started about 20 years ago, 22 years ago to be exact, in 2000, um, spearheaded by Lori Thomas and other people here at the NAIA. Um, pretty much Champions of Character is something that's built off the five uh, categories of what we believe is what every student athlete program institution should strive for, which is integrity, respect, responsibility, sportsmanship, and servant leadership. And those are all five important qualities that we believe here at the NAIA can help build a great athlete, a great program, and help people to keep developing as we plan to do here at the NAIA. And as I said before, I we have something called the Champions of Character Scorecard, which embodies those five characteristics of an institution pretty much, which touch upon community service, GPAs, what the student athletes are doing, um, touches on ejections and things along those lines. And like I said, I can't really uh, go into detail about it, but hopefully at the next one, I can get a little bit more into detail and show you guys more in depth about what the Champions of Character Scorecard is and why it's so important to us.
So thank you guys for the time. I appreciate it. And Paige, it's all you. Okay. I will definitely put your information uh, to all the, the people on the call today in case there's something that comes up in the next month. Um, and thank you all for your participation. I thought the uh, mental health um, session was very valuable and it sounds like there's probably a, a big need and um, lots of dialogue that we can probably have a a session too. So if you enjoyed some of the commentary today, if you have other areas that you'd maybe like Betsy to come back and explore, um, we could definitely get her uh, back and be a part of the conversation to help you all in your current role. So thank you all for uh, your time today. And we will have this on our uh, landing page in the next day. So we'll send that out back out to you. If we don't see you again, have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever, however you celebrate, celebrate you as long as it's happy. All right. Bye, guys.